Hey there you guys, it's Irene Lyon here and welcome to this YouTube channel, welcome to this video. Now this video that you're about to watch right now was taken from a live broadcast I did in my Healthy Nervous System Revolution Facebook group. If you're not part of this group, be sure to join it. The link is somewhere in the show more section. Now once a month, give or take, maybe every three weeks, I do a Facebook Live in this community I record it and then I pop it into YouTube because there's often some really good information and questions that my community members have around healing their nervous system, specifically around emotions, things like anxiety, things like bringing safety back to the nervous system, a lot of good stuff. And at the beginning of this video, I actually give an overview of what the autonomic nervous system actually is, what it governs, how it gets sick, how it gets healthy, and a lot more. So be sure to watch the entirety of this, even if it means pausing it and coming back to it later, and you know, if it takes you one or two days to get through it, that is fine. And I can guarantee you will learn something about your nervous system, your sensations, trauma, and what it takes to heal this very important system. Take good care and enjoy. Hey there you guys, it's Irene Lyon here. Welcome to this Facebook Live. But what I wanted to talk about first while we're getting a few more people on, um, <clears throat> I've got some notes. These are some things that are asked about in this group often. So this group, this Facebook group is called Healthy Nervous System Revolution. The reason it is called this and the reason I have created this Facebook community is because this is one of those things, one of these topics that really isn't well known yet, but it's building. And if you've been following me for a while, or even if you've just sort of stumbled ap across this recently, you'll know that this is, I feel, and many of my clients and participants in my programs feel, they feel it's the missing link. And the reason why, a little quick piece here, the nervous system is connected to everything. So, <clears throat> in other words, when we digest food, so for instance, I have a glass of water here that's got some lemon in it, um, or if I was to eat a piece of toast, or a piece of fruit or something like that, I bring that into my body and I don't have to think about it, right? Makes sense, right? You don't have to think about digesting, digesting your food. Just like you don't have to think about your immune response or um, if you're hot or cold, sweating or shivering, the body automatically puts out a response or a reaction. It notices what's going on and then it adapts it creates what it has to to make basically the human system work. This is what the nervous system does. It's one of the parts. This is why the part of the nervous system I'm really interested in is the autonomic nervous system, which is the automatic nervous system. So the nervous system that automatically governs things like digestion, shivering, sweating, that kind of thing. Now, here's the interesting piece. The other portion of this nervous system, so the autonomic nervous system, it also governs our what I call survival energies, survival energies. So the survival energies are the things that mount our protection responses, so our fight, flight, and freeze. These are things that we don't have conscious control over as well, just like digestion. So if, um, let's just say if there was a loud bang in my house right now, let's hope that doesn't happen, but if there was, and it was kind of um, something that I've never heard before, and it had a really loud vibration, I might jump a little bit, <clears throat> right? I'd have a startle response. This is that fight flight nervous system, mounting an attack, making sure there's no danger, my system would pause, it would orient to the sound, it might get a little tense, I might get ready to go, that's the autonomic nervous system doing its job, okay? Now, imagine this. If I was to stay in that heightened, automatic, autonomic, fight, let's go response, it would be really hard for me to come back here to you and to start teaching again because my unconscious nervous system will be continually looking for that danger, right? Is this making sense? If it is, just give me a little something. Um, so that is one thing. 
if I don't come out of that stress response, it's going to be really hard for my higher brain and it's also going to be hard for the breakfast that I just ate or the water that I'm about to drink to properly digest because all, all resources in the body are going to be waiting and waiting and waiting for that, that danger. Thank you for the thumbs up. Now, what we want is we want to have a system that goes, oh, that was just, um, there's some gardeners outside right now or some contractors working on someone's um, uh, pipes in their house outside. I could then think, oh, that's uh, my neighbor Daniel and they just dropped something, right? That's what that is. Ah, okay, and so once I orient to that thing, I'll be like, oh, no problem. There's nothing here that's a threat and I can come back to using my higher brain to connect with you guys to answer the questions, which I will get to, and my system, my physiology will allow the food to keep digesting, it'll allow my response of preparedness to come down. So that's one example of our autonomic nervous system working for us. It works against us if for some reason we stay ramped up in our fight, flight, freeze. Now, think about having a system, a nervous system, a lifetime, a childhood of constant, constant threat and stress. This is essentially what we are seeing in the research now, and this, is, this forms a huge premise of the work I do. When little people, so babies, when children, when teenagers, even adults, when we are constantly in a, <clears throat> in many ways, a firing squad of stress, whether it's environmental stress, whether it's parents that are, doesn't even have to be abusive, it can be parents that are just too busy to connect with us, and this we're seeing right now in our world of social media and cell phones and distraction, a lot of the children are getting good lives. They're being fed well and they have good shelter and they have tons of programs to do and parents are actually fairly healthy, but what's happening is they're distracted. So they're not able to connect in the same way with their kids. And these little people, when we're little, we need a lot of connection. We need a lot of mirroring. We need to be taught how to soothe from our biology. So there's many, many different reasons for why there's constant stress, threat, and disconnection with our environment. Over time, when we have this kind of environment, it mounts these little fight-flight responses that put us into kind of a higher ad adrenalized state. Over time, that adrenalized state starts to create um, a shutdown response. Our body can't keep putting it itself into an adrenalized fight-flight response and so what does it do? It shuts down. It shuts down, it goes into that freeze response. Now I know a lot of you guys have heard of fight-flight. Many people haven't heard about freeze but I think more people are starting to learn about it which is super super important and when we go into this more sort of shutdown response because we can't keep fighting anymore we realize this is just my life, I'm young, I got these parents, I've got this environment, I have to cope. And this is not a cognitive thing that little people do. They automatically do it. Remember what I said earlier, autonomic nervous system? They automatically have to go into this shutdown response to preserve their own sanity and their own safety. What happens in that shutdown is many things they shut down the feeling from their body. So basically, if you take your hands, play with me here, and if you kind of feel like chin down to sort of your hips, this whole area is where our emotions live, right? We think our emotions come from our brain. They actually come from our body, our core. And in order to survive a threat, threatening, constant barrage of stress every day or disconnection. No one's there to help us with all these feelings and sensations and emotions, which are pretty much all the same thing. So feelings, emotions, sensations, they're kind of all the same thing. When we're really little and we don't know what to do with these things, 
and there's nobody there to listen and to help us, what do you think we do? We shut them down. We stop, we stop feeling everything from the chin down to the hips. I'm going to take a little sip here. So why am I talking about this? This is kind of what we would call the beginning stages of a child or a teenager or even an adult going into a shutdown response. And when we go into this shutdown response, into this, we would call it functional freeze because many people live totally productive lives without, able, without being able to feel their bodies. They are the intellectuals, right? Often they're even the creatives. They're the people that push and work and do tons of stuff. And they don't realize that their poor body is breaking down, that it's literally knocking on the door saying, help, stop, rest, listen to me. Um, but eventually, over time, the body will break down. And to quote one of my favorite authors, Gabor Mate, the body eventually says, no, this is what causes later in life some people, it isn't that late, it can, hap it can happen in teenage years and even some of the kids that are really prone to stress in the childhood years. But typically, late teens, 20s, 30s, the system will eventually break down because of this constant state of fight, flight, and freeze that is on 24-7. Okay, so... Why am I saying this? I'm talking about this because I wanted to give you an overview first of what this group is roughly about, the nervous system, these survival responses that we get trapped in, and then how that impacts the systems. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we have, so I want to wrap this up with one more point. When we have lots of fight and lots of flight, happening wanting to escape but it can't right that kid it can't stand its environment it can't escape it can't leave because that for a child that means death essentially it then goes into the shutdown response because it has to to survive staying in that uncaring kind of conditional no connection household okay Oh, the other thing, make sure if you're here watching this um, to connect with your pelvis, connect with your feet, doesn't mean grounding or anything like that. Just stay present in your body, feel yourself, stay present. That's the main thing I want to um, convey as we go through this, because as I speak about these scenarios and these situations, it will no doubt impact your system because something will pierce through and be... Um, familiar to you. So I want to make sure that if you're sensing a, a something, if a stress reaction mounts because I've said something that sounds like your childhood or your situation, stay present to what happens, whether the heart rate goes up, whether you start to feel sleepy, just, you know, give yourself a little rub, feel yourself stand up, even have a drink of water or something and just stay oriented to where you are and to the speaking that's happening right now. And yeah, it can be very hard to stay present. This is, I'm glad you wrote that, Karen, because this disconnection from the core, and I don't mean muscle core, I mean all of our organs, our heart, our lung system, all this good stuff here. When we've had overwhelming stuff happen, we want to just shut down from it and not be present. This is, in many ways, the pandemic of our Western civilization, is we've done so much to create so much stuff, but the, at, at the expense of being in our systems and feeling our systems. So one of the first steps in this work is being able to stay present to the here and now, which might seem simple when I say it, but it's not when we have lived decades disconnected from the here and now and disconnected from our body system. So, where was I? If I go back, fight, flight, freeze. We need them. So this is the first thing. We need them to survive. We don't want to, however, live in these systems 24-7. It wears out the body. This is what causes burnout. This is what causes something that's kind of a hot topic right now called adrenal fatigue. And adrenal fatigue is something that isn't just... Um, 
metaphorical in that it isn't just the adrenals burning out, it's everything. And if you missed the webinar I did on burnout and adrenal fatigue well over a month ago, um, be sure to take advantage of that and watch it. We have that up on my site right now, um, and we'll link it up in the comments here so you can watch that. It's, about, it's not very long, it's about an hour long. And um, I go through more distinctions of what adrenal fatigue really is. I'm not going to get into it now unless we have time. Um, so fight, flight, freeze, our body's under stress, we shut down. Now here's the interesting thing. Underneath that shutdown still lives the fight, flight. It doesn't go away. So it's like if I take my glass here of liquid, Imagine all the fight flight sitting in here and then a cap on here, right? It's still there. So when we start to heal and become more aware of the nervous system and all the shutdown that we've been in for decades, let's say, what do you think is going to come up and out? What do you think? The sensations connected to fight flight, maybe the memories that put us into fight flight, or sorry, that put us into freeze. The um, body positions and the body actions that we couldn't do because it was too um, unsafe to hit or to punch or to kick or to say the words we wanted to say or to run. Now, every single person is different, so every single person is gonna store their fight flight responses differently because we're all very unique. Now, um, the last vlog I posted, I'm gapping on the title of it, but I make a funny analogy and connection to how humans are very different than cattle or geese or wild animals because we're all raised and reared differently, right? We're all different in how we were brought up and even if we have two parents, male, female parents, they are gonna be raised differently. They aren't necessarily from the same tribe, which means that there might be conflicting ways in which two people raise a child, when really at the end of the day, that child needs exactly what every single other mammal in this world needs, which is connection, care, love, boundaries, teaching right from wrong, all these things, but we, get confused as little ones because the people typically raising us are also confused about what is right and what is wrong. This is in a very first world kind of setting. Tribal cultures, nomadic cultures, hunter-gatherer cultures, the ones that still exist out there, they're not so confused with this because they're really basic. Um, and what happens is that the systems that we're creating just end up not knowing how to release these fight, flight, freeze responses that have been stored up. Um, in these cultures that I just mentioned where there is um, uh, less confusion, there's more being with the land, being with the body, being with, in many ways, the environment, there, there's just not as much shutdown, there's not as much chronic illness because the system is not staying trapped in those fight, flight, freeze responses. And out in the wild, if a person is gravely hurt, typically they die, right? They don't survive. Same with animals in the wild. We often say animals in the wild who are traumatized don't develop PTSD. Well, one of the reasons is when they're highly traumatized, they don't survive. And so us humans, because we're so ingenious and we figured out how to keep people alive, we're having to deal with things that we really shouldn't be dealing with, but we are. So all that to say, this group is about teaching the education that's needed to get the, the grasp of what has to occur so that we can break these patterns of fight, flight, freeze that get stuck in our body and then how we can move these patterns in a way that is safe, that isn't so intense that the person can't handle what's happening and in a way that is continual over time so that this isn't just sort of a, a fix, a one side, a kind of like you fix it and then it's done with. It's ongoing. It takes time and practice and diligence and commitment. So um, I'm going to get into some questions here.
And, and before I do though, there's one question that I want to answer now that I've given you guys a little intro. If you're just joining me now, be sure afterwards to watch from the beginning so that you get the full kind of lead up to where we got to just now. It's been about 20 minutes. Um, so a lot of times I get asked in this group, Irene, what do you think about this form of therapy? Or what do you think about this um, form of body work? Or what do you think about this eating style, etc.? So first thing, in terms of nutrition, I came from a background in nutrition. I studied nutrition in school. I even did a master's degree that involved nutritional aspects. However, I do not bring nutrition into my work. And the reason why is I have seen over and over again that it doesn't make much of a difference. And a lot of you will be like, what? What are you talking about? Here's the thing. As long as you are getting lots of good water, you're eating all the nutrients, so carbohydrate, fat, protein, and remember carbohydrates are vegetables and fruits as well, but grains, good sources of animal protein, good fat. Fat is the most important thing. We tend to, especially in North America, stay away from fat. We should not. We need to eat lots of it because what do you think your brain is made out of? Fat. It's all fat. The nerve cells are wrapped in fat. I'm sure that one of the reasons why we have a lot of trouble in health is because, especially again in North America, is because of the lack of dietary fat that people have not, they just haven't been eating enough of it because we've been scared into thinking it causes heart disease and all these things. So the basic piece with nutrition, get a, an array of foods, eat as whole as you can, but there's nothing wrong with some good old fashioned sugar or caffeine or alcohol, granted it's in moderation. And um, <clears throat> I'm starting to think about actually not allowing comments on nutrition in this group because many of the people here, many of my clients have done every single diet and every single diet under the sun, every single cleanse, every single detox, and they're still unwell. And the reason why is because they haven't dealt with those fight flight responses the freeze responses that are trapped in the nervous system. So if you have a nervous system that is ramped up and living in chaotic survival energy, not only is that taxing on the system, but the digestion doesn't work well when it's in that ramped up space. So you can give it the best nutrition in the world and the system isn't going to slurp it up. It's not going to suck up those nutrients in the way that it's supposed to. What I've seen with a lot of my clients is that when they get this on board, when they start to truly calm, not the mind, but the nervous system, the nervous system physiology at that level, their eating habits aren't as important. Their immune system improves, they heal faster, their gut gets better, and they do nothing about their diet. So I really would love to advocate for just good eating but also having pleasure with your food and not denying we have known now for many many years that diets just don't work restriction doesn't work getting into big fads doesn't work because we're not meant to stay strict in our protocols especially when there's so many beautiful options out there so that's the main thing get your nutrients be smart about it in moderation fat is key the only thing I will say that really shouldn't be eaten are processed fats that have been chemically induced or hydrogenated trans fats those sorts of things are evil as are all the artificial sweeteners that we put into diet sodas just stay away from that stuff so there's my rant on nutrition because a lot of people ask about that second thing is people ask about these these methods um, protocols this kind of body work that kind of therapy here's the thing it all comes down to the practitioner and the client. If the practitioner is truly trauma informed, in other words, they understand everything that I've just been talking about, which sadly is not many people. But if they understand that, they can be a chiropractor, a massage therapist, a Reiki practitioner, a psychic that does energy work. They can be an osteopath, a fitness trainer. I think you're getting my point. 
They understand the trauma response and what occurs in a person's nervous system, how they shut down, how they stay ramped up, then they can do really good work because they will be attuned to the person that they're working with and they will be able to tell, huh, I think my client is going a little dissociated right now. They're going into a bit of a shutdown response. We need to keep them alert so that they don't fall into that. Or if someone's working with someone, say, um, on a table doing, let's say, massage, and the person, they all they can feel is the person's heart rate is just, you know, ramped up, and the person's trying to be relaxed, they're trying to be calm. I've had this happen when I work with people. And I'll be like, are you okay? <laughs> you know, are you, um, are you actually calm, or are you trying to be calm? This is so common. People will go into these healing sessions and they think they just have to go Zen immediately. But if your system is living in a state of fight flight and you come in for this healing session, no healing is going to happen if the underlying fight flight responses aren't addressed. A good practitioner who understands trauma from this deep level will work with that. Now here's the issue. We're at a point in time right now where there aren't enough people who have that level of training. My colleagues do, which is amazing. I'm from the roots of somatic experiencing, which is Peter Levine's work, and somatic practice, which is Kathy Kane's work, and I'm also a Feldenkrais practitioner, which is less trauma-based. It's more higher level brain body stuff. Um, but it all comes down to first the practitioner, okay? And then how well that practitioner is tuned to their own body. So to be really effective at doing body work or um, <clears throat> any type of work with a human, other human being, as the he I don't like to call myself a healer because I'm not healing anyone, but as a practitioner, we need to tune into our own system so that we get, we literally get signals that tell us what to do next or what's happening in that person. It's not about merging with them and taking on their pain. That isn't the point. The point is feeling in our own systems what might be happening in that person. It's attunement. It's the same thing that a mother would have with their newborn baby. At the beginning, they're not so sure what's going on, and then they start to learn with practice and attunement that the kid is hungry or cold or has a poopy diaper or, or whatever. Okay, so a good practitioner will be attuned to their own system, and they're, they'll be attuned to the person they're working with. The second thing, or the third thing, I guess, when it comes to choosing someone to work with is the person who's seeking needs to also use their spidey senses. Now, the trouble with that is not everybody has their spidey senses on board because of trauma, because they're stuck in those fight, flight, freeze responses, and they can't feel. So this is where, again, it requires first a little bit of work, which is again what I teach in my programs, how to sense into your viscera, into the body, into the biological systems so that we have a better representation of who is safe and who isn't safe. And I can tell you, I've worked with many people who have told me they've gone to this practitioner and they had, they had a sense that something didn't feel right, but what did they do? They ignored that sense and they basically went into the session anyway. Their system was in a bit of a stress response because they were unsure. And so they get this body work done. When your system is on that stress response, the practitioner can't work as effectively. And essentially, your money has been wasted because your system never got to drop down to a, a, a nicer kind of more baseline level. Now, this is a very hypothetical, quick example. Um, but... It's very important to realize that it isn't always so much the type of work, it's the interaction and the relationship being formed. Now, if I have no reason to get a manipulation in my spine, then I'm not just gonna to go to a chiropractor for the heck sake of going to a chiropractor, right? So you may choose someone based on your needs, but then once you've chosen the type of work you think you may need, because say maybe you have something out of a line, then you have to go to one level further, which is inquiring with the person. Interview them, talk to them. 
Ask them what they know about trauma. Would they be willing to learn about trauma? It might be that they know nothing about it, but you just really like that person, then that's a good fit, right? Peter Levine always says to us in our trainings, the session starts the moment you see the person walk in or the moment they call you. And as a practitioner, you have to feel good about working with your client. If you don't feel that you can help them, if you feel something not right, then it's not a good fit. So it goes both ways. Um, okay, so that was kind of the, an overview of um, a few things. In terms of just working with people and seeking out more personal work, if you should do that, really just realize it's important to ask these questions and to listen to your own gut instinct, listen to your body, and if it's hard to listen to your body, then learn how to listen to it. And of course, this is what we do here, and this is what I teach in a lot of my programs. So I am going to make sure that there's nothing pressing. <clears throat> um, Heidi asked, I'm looking down at my iPad, you guys. That's why my eyes are down. Um, do your clients with various autoimmune disorders often go into remission after they regulate their nervous systems? This is a big question, Heidi. <coughs> Excuse me. I've seen people shift their symptoms dramatically, dramatically. However, depending on the age of the person, it doesn't always fully get rid of that disease. Um, I'm going to use myself as, a, as an example. Um, some people think that I've had zero trauma because I've talked about my ACE score being zero, which is the Adverse Childhood Experiences study. Just because a person has a zero ACE score does not mean that they have not had trauma. So my trauma was toxic trauma and chemicals when I was in utero with my mom in my mom's belly and then as a child I was exposed to tons of chemicals every day for like 20 years. And the way that my system reacted to that was through skin rashes. Now I had a, a you know, and that is an autoimmune sort of thing that the system is attacking itself. And I've had a lot of healing, I've done a lot of work to get that stuff out and to manage and to regulate my nervous system. However, if I get really stressed or if I release some emotion, my system will give a little bit of a flare. It will not be the way it was, say, five years ago, Heidi, but it will flare up in a way that lets me know that my system is a little taxed. It's the same way with folks that have MS, rheumatoid arthritis, um, even gut problems. They'll say they'll have a flare-up when there's an extra stress. To me, I think um, one of my mentors, Kathy, says that... Um, disease is a very good sign that something's off, right? Clearly, it's a, it's a good um, beacon to let us know that we're off chart, that we need to get back on track. But there have been, Heidi, some people in my programs who have decreased a lot of their inflammation markers. They've decreased their pain in their body. There's quite a few people that have gone through my work who have regulated their nervous systems, and they continue to regulate their nervous system. This is another thing. Regulating your nervous system just doesn't stop okay it's not something that happens and then you're done and then you go on with your life we will continually be be subjected to various stressors emotions there are things that's that are coming out of my system now that are finally coming out because other elements have finally settled and there's a level of security now in my life that's really solid therefore the stuff that's coming out are things that never came out in my trauma training because it just wasn't ready. So needless to say, we're in this world right now where most, us, most of us as humans, I don't think we'll ever be fully finished healing um, if we're living right now in the age bracket of like 20 to 50, 60, 80, right? It's going to take a lot of decades for us to get to this point where we can heal something and then we're pretty regulated because most of us are taxed by just living in this um, complex environment. So yes, keep working on it, exactly. All right, so one question came from Naveed. Hi, Naveed, thanks for being patient as I get to this. So he's completed the 21-day nervous system tune-up, that's awesome. 
Um, for those of you that don't know the 21 day nervous system tune up, it's my self study course. That's kind of in a way the prerequisite to my longer 12 week program. So the 21 day tune up isn't all of it. It is just the beginning. I, I'm trying to become more clear with people on that because often folks think that they do the 21 days and then everything should be fine and that's not the case. I wish it were the case. Trust me, I, I do, but it's not. So um, he's writing from Indonesia, which is great. So I would love to hear you speak more about somatic experiencing, in particular about learning the language of sensations. It is, enough, is it enough to stay with sensation till it calms down or do we or we, do we have to find the reason behind it to make it get out of our system? Ah, I see. Please, sh please shed some light on this. <clears throat> so first of all, for those of you that don't know, somatic experiencing, we often abbreviate it SE for short. It's the work of Peter Levine, someone that developed this method when he realized that humans in our crazy wild world, we do not release stress. We keep it stored in. If you were here at the beginning of the talk, I talked about storing the fight, flight, freeze in our bodies. We do that and we're very unique in the animal kingdom for doing that. And this is what causes, <coughs> excuse me, chronic illness. So he developed a form of work to work with not just sensations, but memories, body movements, spontaneous body movements, um, imagery, the whole nine yards. Basically, I call it all of human experience is worked with when you work with SE, at least someone who's well trained in SE. Now, we don't need to know the reason behind a sensation. And actually, I would say, Naveed, that it's next to impossible to be able to know where our sensations come from because if you think about the nervous system, I don't know the stats on this, but you know they talk about the lung tissue being the size of a giant football field. The nervous system is kind of infinite. It's almost like the universe inside our body because not only are there actual nerves that are tissue, it's they're white when you pull them out, they they, they form connections and pathways and highways and byways, and they're just all over the system, lighting up, shutting down, lighting up, reconnecting, rewiring. And when the nervous system is processing stuff, processing, let's say, memory, processing emotion, um, we'll have sensation. And sensation is kind of one of these things that um, the way to work with it is to become very good at feeling it, noticing it, and then this is one of the most important things, not being afraid of it. So because of our cultures, which most of us, not many cultures in the Western world, first world, even second world, um, allow the expression of sensation and emotion. We keep it pretty close, close knit into our bodies. But these sensations have something to say usually, or they have a movement that might go with it, or an emotion that might go with it, or it might just be an energy burst that goes through the body and we feel it and then we allow it to just dissipate and integrate. Because we've become so disconnected from here down, when we feel something, typically we go into a stress response. We get scared because um, we feel a tightness in our chest or our throat, or we feel these tingles coming down our legs. Now, of course, we want to be able to distinguish the difference between tingles down our legs because an actual nerve is pinched, like, say, in sciatica. That's different. So if you have ruled out things like that and you know that it's not because there's a nerve pinch and it's causing pins and needles because there's no blood supply, if that's ruled out, and you're getting, you know, sensations, the key with sensations is to, to do our best to not be afraid of them, to feel them, to sense them, and to let them do its thing. And one of the classic um, lines I would say with clients when I'm working with them is, so you feel that sensation, sense it, notice it, 
and let's just wait while we feel it or while they feel it because I'm not feeling it and then what happens next or what happens now or if that sensation could speak would it say anything if that sensation could move what would it do what gesture would it make if that sensation had a color or a sound what sound would it make if there was an image connected to that sensation what would the image be some people might say oh well it looks like this black sludge or it looks like water or it looks like um I don't know spaghetti sauce whatever 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 a person's mind comes up with is the right answer and what often when people are searching their sensations and feeling them they might inevitably always say to me well this is gonna sound really weird but it feels like this and I say of course it's not weird this is just what's naturally coming out of your system therefore it's good that you're feeling this and able to connect meaning or image or color now one caveat to this I've been talking about how sensations might have these attributes such as color or sound or words or quality of feeling if there isn't anything and it's just all I feel is tingles or all I feel is a squeezing or all I feel is um, heat or coolness um, that's okay too and humans because of this mind of ours we're always trying to figure it out and sometimes we just can't figure this stuff out it's actually next to impossible the reason why I say this is when there's been early trauma when there has been developmental trauma when there has been let's say um, birth trauma surgical trauma like when a child is really small under the age of three at that age all that they're feeling is sensation and if it's so overwhelming that they can't handle it they'll go into that shutdown response but under that shutdown response is all this trapped sensation and fight flight energy so as adults when they start to work with their body and work with the nervous system stuff will start to release start you know the heart rate might <clears throat> go up really fast or they might all of a sudden have a flash of coolness or heat or sweating for no reason like they're just sitting there still and all of a sudden the heart starts to beat they start to get um, flush or sweaty often when that happens people think they're having a heart attack of course sometimes that can happen but let's just say that you've got yourself checked out and there are no <coughs> excuse me no circulatory problems everything is fine and you're like well what's going on often that is old 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 survival energy flushing out of the system and creating these fight-flight responses because the fight-flight responses were never able to be felt and processed when you were like 18 months old or six months old or even in utero right so we can't always figure these out I just want to make sure I get to all the points of your question so it is enough to stay with a sensation and sometimes it isn't so much about calming it down but being with it accepting it feeling it and staying grounded in the body now um, in the 21 day course we just just get into we just pierce the surface with how to stay connected to the body in the course I talk about orienting to the here and now I talk about orienting to your body feeling the body against the ground against the surface that it's on um, but it doesn't go into all the other elements of growing capacity in the human system to essentially take in more sensation so this is what the final piece to this <clears throat> is that when we've had a lot of shutdown our capacity to feel shrinks it's like it's literally like tiny and so when we grow our capacity when we start to work with the body and when we start to kind of loosen up the edges a little bit we build I call it the swimming pool so this is an analogy I do in my three-part healing trauma series which I'll do in September um, when we start to grow the capacity in the body there's more room for sensation to be felt so one of the things that happens when we start to do this work and it can be dis very troubling for some when they felt nothing so say their capacity is so small 
like this, they feel nothing, but they're also shut down, so it's not a good thing. When we open up the system a little bit more, there's more room for those sensations to, let's say, party, right? So they're having a party now. They're like, oh, this is amazing. We can actually move. But the person's cognition isn't tuned to this party that's going on in their system. So then our higher brain then <clears throat> freaks out and goes into a fear response. And then what do you think happens? It can go close back again. Or we're in the situation where there's more sensation, more feeling, and a person doesn't know how to contain it. And so when there's this quality of excess sensation and too much sensation, and it's just overwhelming, some of the things that we can do, but it doesn't, everyone is different. Remember I mentioned this earlier ago when I talked about um, humans all being raised differently and our our way of dealing with things are all different. So I can't say do this and then do this and do this and do this. This is why this is tricky work. I hope you guys are getting that. Um, because some people <clears throat> will do a classic practice that I practice, which is to orient. So in other words, to pause, look around, and you guys can all do this right now with me, slowly, and just see the environment. Now for some, when they orient to the here and now, it can be very calming because the excess sensation is literally pulling them out of the here and now, and that in itself is scary. And yet most people don't realize that that causes people to go into a fear response, but it can. It's like they're being robbed of their here and now-ness, right? Their present moment-ness. So for some, just, oh yeah, whew, here I am. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm in my house. There's the, the curtains and okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. And then that can help the sensations not disappear, but just settle. Now, some people who have had significant early trauma where the environment was indeed threatening and unsafe, you ask them to do that and what do you think? This gets worse or it just shuts down. <clears throat> and again, we can't predict this. You will know yourself better than me. So if you know that looking out into the vastness of your world is too much, stay really close. So right now I'm sitting here, I've got my iPad right here, I've got some pens. It might be just taking, again, this is just hypothetical, it might be just taking your hands, putting them on your desk, and just feeling the wood, feeling the coolness of the wood. It might be taking your hands and hugging like this. This is a vlog I've made called, um, I think it's DIY, it's like do-it-yourself medicine, um, where you're containing and feeling the body and staying um, essentially with yourself and not going into the, the big, bad, scary world. That can also help some people tremendously. Some people need to pick up a phone and call someone. They need to connect, right? So depending on the type of early trauma, the misattunement a person had, they will need different solutions to help this in intense sensation come down. One of the things that's really misunderstood in the world of mind-body is that um, anxiety is one of them, you know, Okay, I've got this anxiety, I've got a panic attack happening, I have to find as many ways to stop the qualities. And the thing is, is sometimes what we have to do is feel the intensity and in li literally one of my analogies is surf it, surf the wave, it's like a tsunami, and surf it and navigate it so that it eventually comes down to the shore, like to the beach. And then it, if you ever watch ocean water come into the beach, it comes up and then what does it do? Right? It sinks into the sand. Essentially, that's what we want to have happen when we have a big response to something. We want to be able to, to surf these waves and wait until it crests and then phew, comes down. Whereas a lot of people, a lot of remedies, a lot of solutions is you feel this anxiety and it's like, just stop it. Don't let it crest. What do you think happens when you stop it before it crests and comes down and integrates? 
that gets trapped back into the system and it still keeps circulating in that nervous system. It doesn't go away. So um, <clears throat> I'm glad that analogy worked. Um, so Naveed, I hope that gave you a little bit of insight. My suggestion for anyone that's done the 21 day training, keep doing it. So there are some folks, I'm gonna rephrase that. Often when a course is taken, people assume I you go through it and then at the end it's done. And if I haven't done my job at expressing this, then that's my own, I apologize. What I want to make sure is that you continue to practice the exercises in there, whether it's through my audio lesson or what you recall from doing it with me. Or maybe you listen to my recording again and then you find your own unique way of orienting or being with tension and finding the relaxation, that kind of thing. It's important to keep practicing it because you'll find that when you redo these lessons, each time, each pass, they, there might be something different. Um, and then the other thing too is if um, <clears throat> a person knows that they have more early trauma or just more misattunement or there was danger growing up, then the next program that I put together, which is the 12-week program, Smart Body, Smart Mind, that's the next obvious step. And that will run again in October, October 17th. And then if you're watching this and if you've done the 21 days, or even if you haven't and you want to start doing this work, when you do the 21 day course, that cost is taken off of the 12 week because the content in the 21 days has been curated from the 12 week as a way to get people started when we're not in session with the 12 week program. I hope that makes sense. So next question is Sylvia. And Sylvia writes, I would love to hear how we can, oh, this is great. Good timing, Sylvia just talked about this. So I would love to hear how we can create a safe space in our body. <clears throat> so if I experience some cold or hunger or sleepiness, I get into hyper arousal and fear immediately and have to cancel whatever, uh, and have to cancel whatever I do to take care of my, my physical needs. I would like to enable my body to feel so safe that, that it knows having to wait some minutes will not endanger its survival. So this is a great question about safety. So Sylvia, if you're here watching or if you're here watching after, I've already given you the theory in this 50 or so minutes of what you need to know. And that is when there has been fight, flight and freeze in our constitution, in our biological constitution from beginning, even in utero through childhood, the system, the system inevitably, your nervous system, will have usually these scripts, and they are the world is a dangerous place, that's one of them, or everybody out there is unsafe, everyone is a threat, everything is a threat, and I'm all alone and there's nobody there to protect me, I'm, I'm alone. This is what occurs when a little person has gone through some kind of surgical trauma. So again, I don't know your history, so you'll have to <clears throat> investigate knowing what you know about your early history. But were there any surgical traumas? Were you a preemie, a premature infant? Were you were in an incubator away from connection? Was mom um, mentally unstable, had postpartum, wasn't able to attune, wasn't able to connect? Um, were there any near death experiences growing up? These are very, very important. They often get missed. They are near drownings, choking, high fever, high inf like infections, where a little child's physiology literally goes into survival response and the whole system mounts an attack to survive. And if you're living now watching this, obviously you did survive, but there is a underlying energy that is still waiting for death to happen and it's important to work with this fear and help it shift finally 
This also occurs when there is a lot of trauma in the household, when there's a lot of danger, when there's a lot of threat, whether it's physical, emotional, sexual abuse, whether there's not enough food. I think it's interesting that you say, if I experience cold or hunger or sleepiness, that tips off something in my brain that maybe wonders if when you were really little, if your hunger needs weren't met, if you weren't properly um, <clears throat> sheltered, if it was cold, so again, this is attunement with a baby. Um, so I think that it's important to assess what might have happened, and maybe you don't know. And again, you can still work with these things if you don't know. But first thing when establishing safety, and this is kind of the way that I work with all my clients, first of all is education. So you're here learning, that's important. So that you start to kind of get this idea like, oh, that did happen to me. I forgot my, that I almost died due to dehydration and they couldn't get fluids into me. I wouldn't eat, those sorts of things. So those are that's important is education, understanding the theory that I've been talking about. Second, um, if you have the capacity to find a somatic experiencing practitioner, that's what I practice, um, and someone who's trained in something called somatic practice, which is the work of Kathy Kane, specifically someone who's trained in her early trauma work, that work is all based on helping the person reestablish uh, re cellular safety. And it's a type of safety that you cannot mantra your way into. In other words, you can't sit there and be like, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe, journaling, I'm safe, the world is not dangerous, I'm okay. That doesn't work. And you know why it doesn't work? It's because it's cognitive, it's all in the higher brain. But these early patterns of stress and survival were, were pre-verbal. They were before you could speak, before you could make meaning with the world. Therefore, that kind of, um, <clears throat> we'll call it therapy, it doesn't work at this core level. So, um, like I said, working with someone in the SE community who has training in Kathy Kane's work, there's a type of work in that world that's called touch work, where the practitioner is using touch not to manipulate or not to send energy into the system, but to essentially provide a tethering to the here and now and when we do this work, there's this intentionality of safety. So rather than me saying to the client that I might work with, you're safe, you're safe, you're safe, I am pretty much putting my system into a state of intentional safety and letting them know that I am rock solid and I am here. This isn't compassionate, oh, you're okay, you're gonna be okay. I would never say that to someone. Someone that has had preverbal trauma, you never want to say, oh, you'll be fine, you, you know, you've got, you know, we love you. That doesn't work because, again, they don't register with this because it's cognitive. It has to be felt. This is where it gets very Star Wars, very Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? It's that energy of safety and intention, which is very different than kind of the woo-woo-ish um, self-love kind of work. And I've got a, a blog, vlog, Aaron, you can post this on why um, self-love doesn't always work. It's about 16 minutes. But when we've had this kind of early trauma and we don't feel safe, self-love work can actually backfire because it hasn't been written into our cells. So we need to build it up slowly with touch and then working at <clears throat> what I call the stress organ level. So that's working with the kidneys, the adrenals, the gut, the gut is our first brain. So when we're babies, we don't have this thing on board, the brain, we do, but it's very primitive. We have the gut, our gut feels everything. So part of the work at reestablishing safety is being able to talk to the gut and assure it and tell it that it's okay and that it's safe. Now, I say this like this is excuse me, simple work that just can be done in a heartbeat, it takes time. So finding someone that can help you with that is key because um, creating that safe space that you're craving will require this level of detailed, intentional work where you're literally being 
placed into the field of safety from the practitioner you're working with. Now, in um, the 12 week course that I run twice a year, Smart Body, Smart Mind, we get into this. We get into self touch work that is highly intentional. I need to drink a bit more. We get into this kind of work that is um, self touch, intentional, safety, all these things that maybe a baby didn't get when they were really, really young. I'm going to cough just a sec. <coughs> mm, talking too fast. So in that program, we layer the foundations such that a person can enter into feeling their body space that maybe they never were able to feel before with safety. Maybe when they felt it, it was terrifying. So if someone had surgical trauma and they were being po poked and prodded with needles and IVs and catheters, anything that happened to the body was a threat. Even though it was to save them, it was still a threat. So to heal that, there needs to be this entry of very gentle, very intentional touch where the touch and the intention of touch is not to harm, but to soothe. Right, so this is kind of what you would do with a child um, if you were trying to soothe it after it had an accident. You wouldn't try to manipulate them or change them. It would just be to hold them and let them know that they're okay. So that level of intentional energy um, communication is, is so key when helping to reestablish safety in the human nervous system when something has thrown it off of safety. So that's my very long way of explaining what has to happen to bring safety back on board. It takes time, it takes practice, it takes the right type of practitioner, the right type of work. Um, that's the stuff that I teach in my programs. My colleagues um, work with this. I have some referrals that I can offer you if you want to look for someone that has this or just look up the somatic experiencing with somatic practice and and go that way and then also be sure to go back to what I said earlier about finding the practitioner that's right for you you have to go with your gut and you've got to find someone that you feel you really connect with all right <clears throat> okay I'm just looking at the comments there so one last question here comes from Wendy Johnson thank you she couldn't make it but I will answer it she says um, <clears throat> the emotions that were stuffed, so the emotions that were held in from early childhood, once they are expressed in the present day, do they tend to resurface multiple times or does it depend? It depends. So it depends on what is stored, why the emotions are stored. Um, emotions that are stored because of a car accident and then you had to have a surgery afterwards is very different than emotions that were stuffed due to a lifetime of chronic abuse from a parent, let's say. Because one is more of a shock trauma event, say that car accident and then you had surgery. That te te technically, we would say, will be a little easier to work with because there was a beginning, an event, and an ending. And then we can process and we negotiate that traumatic event where that person then feels, and I'll say this because this is a common thing that we might say when working with someone, when did you know everything was going to be okay? Right? So when did you know when you were actually okay, when you were no longer being threatened in that accident or in that surgical procedure? Often a person will be like, well, I never have. And then in that moment, they then resonate and feel, holy cow, I am safe. I'm not stuck in that car anymore, or I'm not on that sur surgical table. And then the emotions come out. Usually it's tears of relief, tears of relief. It's different when the situation <clears throat> and the stored up stuff is due to multiple, multiple years of having to basically thwart your physical 
your physicality and your emotionality. This is why um, it's just been proven time and time again that early childhood trauma is the trigger for chronic illness later in life. And it's because you can't process that kind of fear when you're that little. So what the happens is the body does it for you by creating a physical illness or a mental illness or an autoimmune con condition or cancer or heart disease. And so when working with the emotions later in life because of something like early adversity that was chronic, <clears throat> it takes a more titrated, more slow approach so that Remember I gave you that example of the filled up fight flight responses and then all the sensations that come with it. We need to take those out slowly and we need to build the capacity in the system slowly because the system has got so used to holding all this in that we actually don't want to break it open too quickly because if we break it open too quickly, the system won't know how to integrate all that excess energy and then that's what lends to people having kind of the classic nervous breakdown or we hear about like kundalini awakenings where a person just blows up their energy and they can't contain it. Um, this is also what happens in um, very intense meditation retreats where a person is asked to be so focused and they cannot handle everything that's stored inside. So again, this is why in the programs that I do, it might for some people seem painfully slow and painfully easy and the lessons are only maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes and we lose some people sometimes because they feel that it's not quick enough and they're not getting this big blow up experience and actually I think that's good. We need to actually, <clears throat> it's kind of like even drinking a glass of water. I mean, you could drink this down in one big gulp if your stomach was ready for it, but really the best way is to drink it slowly, little sips at a time. You feel it go down your esophagus, it goes into your stomach, and then you have another drink. Same with eating, right? So when it comes to healing the nervous system and healing these emotions and these sensations and these trapped trauma responses, it must be done slowly. It must be done continuously. It must be done with commitment and a willingness to literally learn a different language and to know that this is not something that can happen in three months or six months or even a year. Some of my most devoted participants that I've worked with and clients that I work with one-on-one, -on -one, they've been at this for 18 months, two years. And while that might seem like a long time, it actually isn't. When you really think about the scope of life and how long we survived when we were children and teenagers, it's nothing to work on this for a few years because once you get the base level foundation on board and you build your capacity and you become skilled at being with the sensations, as I mentioned with Naveed's question, establishing cellular safety, which is what I mentioned and talked about with Sylvia's question, when you get those baseline pieces down, many things fall into place and it becomes just kind of like speaking a new language rather than having to pull up oh what was that what was that conjugation when i say this or what's the name for computer i don't remember <clears throat> at the beginning it's kind of you're clumsy it's a new but as you get the language on board sensations that come in traumas that come in because they will keep happening stressors things that we see in the media changes in climate with the weather they, they come to us and then we know how to work with them and we don't fear our body responses in the same way. So um, I'm just going to look at some questions here. So Robin asks, is touch in that way a thing that clinical helps offer if no family or friends can step into that space? I'm not 100% sure on that question, but I think I'll decipher it in this way. Um, Touch, if you don't have someone that can offer touch or a practitioner, a lot can be done with the self, so self-touch. Um, friends can too. What I've found, um, and this isn't for everyone, but a lot of the times when our environment and the people that we grew up with were so toxic and so just downright abusive, it can be really beneficial for a human being to just work with themselves 
with with a group and a lot of people ask <clears throat> how is it possible to do healing work via an online um, group and um, this is the, the paid programs I run and I just kind of say well it does I've watched it work some people need a little bit of extra complement complementary support with a practitioner but a lot of the people that have a mindset that wants to do the work and wants to heal they want to get safe in their system in their cells they can do a lot by imparting that energy to themselves and that healing touch to themselves so I hope that is what you are asking if not let me know I'm just gonna look at my texts here to see if there's anything I'm missing <clears throat> Robin asks, so is it important to feel and allow for the trapped energy to release? Yes, it is. Um, would you want to allow it if dissociation is happening? So typically when a person starts to dissociate or go into that level of freeze, they're not going to be able to release anything because the system has gone into kind of a shutdown mode and when you go into that shutdown mode you literally numb out from feeling and noticing the sensations and being with the emotions so um, typically it won't, wouldn't happen what sometimes happens and I've seen this um, unfortunately in big groups that where I've gone to conferences and seminars is an exercise let's say will be done with the class where half the class um, where it's very intimate and maybe you're having to think of a memory or you're having to do an action or say something or sing or dance you know there'll be kind of a third of the room because they're healthy and well regulated will love it and they'll have a great time another third of the group will do the exercise and they'll just get so aroused that they think that they're experiencing really good energy but they're actually in fight flight and so their endorphins are going and then another third of the group will just kind of you'll see them they'll just have this blank look on their face and they'll pretend to go through the motions of the exercise but they're really not connected they're not there but due to peer pressure they just do it anyway um, <clears throat> so you see that sometimes where something will be asked of a person or of a group and a person can actually override override their dissociation and um, display what they think is supposed to happen but it's actually not coming from their organic intelligence it's just an action that's being manufactured to satisfy the therapist or the group so that is where a person can be in dissociation and it might look like they're expressing something but true release of emotion and trauma cannot happen when a person is in freeze it just isn't it's not possible um, and then you asked or are you wanting ah, so I've already answered that um, Becky asked would you walk would you give an example of helping someone through an anxiety attack I wish I could because everyone's gonna be different um, I think that hopefully if you're still listening Becky um, you get this idea that this is not a one-size-fits-all I gave that example of some people might help to come into the here and now where others have to stay really close and others might just need help um, surfing this tsunami of sensation um, <clears throat> so everyone's going to be different um, I had what would be considered my first ever panic attack last year but I don't like using the words panic and anxiety because at the end of the day, it ha they, that isn't what they are. They're sensations. They're physiological responses that are being emitted from the nervous system. And there was nothing wrong with my heart. It, like I thought, my God, is this a heart attack? Um, but it wasn't. I got checked out. It was old, old trauma from early, early, early in my life that was coming up and out. And it was like fireworks. And luckily, because of my skill and my knowledge, I was able to just stay with it. But I had to use every single tool that I knew, orienting, feeling my feet. I called my husband. I, I was driving when this happened. I 
was able to get across the bridge and I have no fear of driving. So it was just the timing hit and this huge physiological reaction came out. I surfed the wave, I came out of it and then I was really tired for the rest of the day and there was nothing wrong with me. I went and got checked. So, you know, everyone's different. What I've found, um, <clears throat> Becky, is that when people understand, I'm going to end with this, when people understand what is going on, what could be going on, when they understand the physiology, when they understand that these reactions are a natural expression of stored and trapped trauma and stress response, we fear them less and we actually welcome these reactions. I know for some that might seem crazy, but it becomes a welcoming thing. It's like, oh, thank God, something is popping out of my system right now and I'm going to be with it and contain it. Um, Erica asks, this is, the, this is always the toughest question, Erica, but I'm happy to answer it. How do you get out of freeze by doing the exercises in the 21-day course? It depends on the person, Erica. What I've found is that when someone is in shutdown and freeze as a result of more earlier trauma, chronic stress throughout childhood, the 21 day is not going to get you there because it's just the beginning. And I don't get into the working at the level of the body in the same way, through the touch, the joints. We work with the gut, we work with the brain stem, we work with the kidney adrenals. Um, Getting out of freeze, again, it's not easy. It takes time because we have to literally work with the system to let it know that it is a little more cellular, cellularly safe. And the 21 day, its purpose isn't that. It's just to lay the foundations of the theory, offer some self-awareness and awareness-based exercises if you've done it. Um, I'm not sure if you have, but if you've done it, you'll know that it's a little more basic and it's basic for a reason because it's just the beginning. And then when we get into the longer work, whether it's with me in the 12 week course or you choose to work with a practitioner who's trained in the work that I do, <clears throat> it will involve touch, it'll involve working with the gut, with sound um, and growing that capacity of the nervous system so that it can actually feel safe to come out of freeze because often a person's system will not come out of freeze until it knows there's a little more capacity on board to do that. Um, also sometimes getting out of freeze requires instigating and kind of poking a little bit at the anger and healthy aggression response depending again on the type of trauma that we've had. We may have deep, deep rage and aggression and anger stored inside but again if I go back to that example of letting out too much too quick we don't want to just go into working with anger. We need to build the foundation of the system so that it can handle the big energies of, say, anger and rage and aggression when they're ready to come out. I hope that makes sense. Um, coming out of freeze is tricky. It, it takes time. I was myself in a very functional freeze pattern when I got into this work. I was successful. I was smart. I had relationships. I had friends. Um, so I wasn't in a chronic illness state, I was just very functionally frozen and it took a few years of learning and letting some tears out and learning how to set boundaries and finding a safe relationship with my husband and work that I love and as that slowly started to fall into the right tracks, my body came out of its freeze response. But it doesn't mean that if I go into a situation where there's a little more stress, a little more something that my body will start to kind of go into its habit, but now I have the tools to notice, oh, like my digestion's been a bit off this week, what's going on? And it's like, oh, it's because I never expressed this thing to that person, or I've been pushing too much, or I haven't been getting enough exercise, or whatever it might be. So I hope that explains that one, Erica. Um, thank you everybody for being here. I'm going to sign off. I'm needing to uh, go to the go and do some stuff myself. Uh, too much liquid in my system. But um, thank you for being here. If you are new to this work, 
be sure to download um, I've got lots of free resources um, Aaron can pump um, put to the bottom here um, in the guidelines of this group um, I, it's important to read the guidelines please read the guidelines of this group I really like to keep this community tightly woven around the nervous system does not mean that I don't believe in other practices and other elements of health I just want to keep this group really knit tightly knit around this stuff so read the guidelines and at the end of that page is um, some of the things that I recommend people start with one is the seven steps to de-stress which is an ebook that I have written it's an old ebook but it's still really good so be sure to read that if you haven't yet there's also a audio that you can listen to that guides you through these seven steps and then from there you can go to my website and we've got like five ebooks a few audio programs there's some interviews and then of course if you're ready to do the the work and start the kind of the prerequisite work that 21 day nervous system tune-up you can start at any time it's 21 days does not mean that there is a lesson on every 21 days I want to be very clear with that there's some people that have had confusion so very quickly in that program there are five training videos called the biology of stress and then there are six audio lessons which are my neurosensory exercises that stuff has been taken out of my 12-week program to get you started then if you want to do the longer program with me that gets into the deeper elements of working with the stress organs working with anger and aggression and early trauma that will start up in October of this year on the 17th so stick around. Thank you for listening to me talk and teach, and we will catch you next time.